What tremendous truth. Because Jesus has come. Well, if you have your Bibles, perhaps turn with me to Psalm chapter 90. I really wanted to get back into Genesis because I was so excited about chapter 6. If you read the first few verses of chapter 6, you can see why I'm so excited about them. And uh, so do come next, next Sunday to um, hear more about the very interesting first few verses of chapter 6 of Genesis. But today, toward the end of the year, we'll look at Psalm 90. The backdrop of Psalm 90 is Psalm 89. It's not rocket science, I know, but there it, there it is. It's the backdrop and it's what we, I read at the beginning. And 90 begins book 4 of the Psalms. I really encourage you to get to know your Psalms. Book 4 of the Psalms starts with Psalm 90. So therefore, Psalm 89 ends book 3 of the Psalms. Really profound, that is. But the Psalms are actually tied together. And they're even textually tied together. Because if you look at Psalm 89, what we read in verse 46, it says, How long, O Lord? Which is the cry of many hearts, isn't it? How long? And you notice in the midst of Psalm 90 that that same plea is lifted up in verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long? So the psalmist is giving us a clue in chapter Psalm 90 that there is something that has happened in Psalm 89 that is the reason why this psalm is at the beginning of book 4. And here is the problem, because if you look back at Psalm 89, to the beginning of it, you notice the language, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever, with my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. It sounds like a very happy song. And you don't realise when you start Psalm 89 that Psalm 89 is a dirge. It isn't happy at all. But it starts out with this exclamation. I will sing of the mercy of the Lord forever. But if you look at Psalm 89 from verse 38 to the end. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him, he has become the scorn of his neighbours. And it goes on like that till the end. So Psalm 89 begins by rehearsing God's promises to David and to Israel. And then it ends lamenting the fact that God's judgment has been visited on David and Israel. So the people of God are singing the first 37 verses, which look very happy and upbeat, through blinding tears, because... They think that the promises of God have failed. They're singing them through tears because they think that the promises of God have failed. So that's the backdrop of Psalm 90. The people of God in Psalm 89 are facing the biggest problem of all the theology of the Old Testament. And the problem is this. How have the promises of God to David and Israel failed? Have the promises failed? And in 2 Samuel 7, you see God promised David that there would be descendants from his line on the throne of Israel forever. We've been looking at that as a family this last week. God's promises to David. And he promised that Israel would always be in the land. How did that end up? How did that go, go for them? We're told that the last king of Israel saw his own children put to death. And then his eyes were put out. And he was taken to Babylon to live as a captive in the king's court for the rest of his life. Having only now the final memory of sight being the death of the line of David. And the children of Israel go into captivity with him. So everyone in Israel from 586 on is asking, have your promises to David and your people Israel failed, Lord. You told us that David would always be on the throne and that we would always be in the land. And now there's no king of David's descendants on the throne 
and we are in exile. That's Psalm 99, sorry, Psalm 89, singing through tears. And that's why Psalm 90 is here. The psalm turns to God for help from old truths that he had delivered way back in the days of Moses. Behind this psalm is Deuteronomy 32 and 33. There are words in this psalm that go back to Genesis 1, 2 and 3. And what is happening, and I think this is so important, that the people of God are turning to old words, old truths, to help them in their present plight. Which should be a wonderful lesson for us. In hard times, God's people look back to old paths. They go back to God's old words and they find them to be fresh and true and relevant and meaningful. And that's what we're going to find out for a few minutes this morning. There are lots of ways that I could outline Psalm 90 for you. I could just outline it, God, that would be my outline, God. And that would be a very good outline of the psalm. Or you could outline it in two parts. 1 to 11 as a meditation on God, and verses 12 to 17 as a petition to God. A meditation on God and then a petition to God. There's a theological meditation in verses 1 to 11 about God, and in verses 12 to 17 a prayer to God. Or we could say verses 1 and 2 are about God, verses 3 to 6 about brevity of life and death, 7 to 11 about death, sin and wrath, and 12 to 17 about grace. But I just wanted to outline it in four parts, four points, which we'll come to. That God is our home, number one. God is home. Secondly, God is eternal. So God is home, God is eternal. Thirdly, God is just. And finally, God is gracious. And we need to know all of these things in times of trouble. Let's pray as we read God's word. Father, this is your word. We need your word more than we need food. For we do not live by bread alone, but by, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So speak, Lord. Your servants listen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the word of God. Hear it in Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place for all, in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday when it is past, there is a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favour of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. Thus then, it's this reason of God's inerrant word. May he write his eternal truth upon our hearts. Are you sad or lonely or lacking in hope? Then this is a psalm for you. Or are you so content with your life that you've not learned to count your days, to contemplate eternity? Then this is a 
psalm for you. In this psalm, Moses points us to God as the solution to our plight. And he teaches us that God is home, eternal, just and gracious. So God is our home. In verses 1 and 2, 1 and 2, Moses points out the great comfort of God himself. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now this is something that Moses understood experientially. It was Moses' plight to spend the entirety of his life and ministry as the leader of Israel, as a nomad. He, didn't ne he never settled in Canaan with the people of God. He died just having a glimpse of the land. He lived 40 years as a nomad. So when he says that God is our dwelling place, he knows what he's talking about. Because he did not have an earthly home. But God was his home. He never was able to say, Moses, that Canaan is my dwelling place, the promised land is my dwelling place. No, all he can say is, God is my dwelling place. You see why this is so appropriate for the children of Israel in captivity, who are saying, Lord, what has happened? We are not in the land that you promised to us. We're in exile. We're being made by our captors to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. And here is Moses' words waiting for them. God is your dwelling place. God is your home. God is your refuge. God is your city. God is the place where you belong. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, we belong with God. That's a place that you can feel at home. And I love the fact that it just doesn't say that the Lord provides refuge. This really struck me this week. The Lord provides our refuge. No, it says the Lord is our refuge. Moses says a word almost a thousand years before this psalm is placed in its position at the beginning of book four. With a people of God publicly lamenting the situation of the end of the Davidic monarchy and with the captivity of Israel, and he points them to God. God is your refuge. You may not have a present home, but God is your home. Brothers and sisters, God is our home. Secondly, God is eternal. If you look at verses 3 to 6, he contrasts the brevity of human life with God's eternal, etern, et, eternality. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. And, this, and we know this verse well, don't we? For a thousand years in your sight are up like yesterday, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. In short... We are short and God is long. It is a contrast between the brevity of life and the everlasting nature of God. But notice the contrast is the comfort. If this isn't here to discourage us, it's not meant for us to say, oh my goodness, I've only got 70 or 80 years. No, it's not meant to discourage us, it is meant to encourage us. Because here is the idea, if your hope is in something that dies with you, you have no lasting hope. But the good news is, because we hope in God who outlives us, we have a hope which outlives us. We are short, but he is long. He is eternal. This is reality. He is eternal. Therefore, our hope can last. Because even everything that the world hopes in will eventually pass. I am not any prophet of gloom, but there will be another coronavirus. There will be something else. But he is eternal. Abide with me. Fast falls the even tide. 
And one of my favourite lines in that hymn is this one. And I, I, I love it that this hymn, which, which I absolutely love as a hymn, millions of people sing all over the world because they play it at the FA Cup football final as well. But it says, Change and decay all around I see. O oh, thou that changest not, abide with me. Do you see what Henry Francis Light is doing with that line? He is drawing comfort from the unchangeability of God. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. God is unchangeable in his power and wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth. God is infinite, eternal, and that is unspeakably comforting to me. When I was studying this this week, I just sat there and contemplated that God is eternal. God is eternal. Change and decay all around I see, O thou that changes not, abide with me. Moses is asking you to draw comfort from the unchanging, everlasting nature of God. That's what we have to do in 2020, the end of 2020, in this little room in Keswick, is that we can draw comfort from the eternal nature of God. That's where our hope lies. That is where our hope lies. Your hope is in a God who goes on. Thirdly, God is just. Verses 7 to 11. And here Moses ties together misery and death to sin and misery to God's wrath and judgment. Verse 7, he speaks about being brought to an end by your anger. Verse 8, you've set your You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. In verse 10, the years of our life are 70 or 80. In verse 11, who considers the power of your anger? In other words, it isn't just that life is brief, it's like a breath. It's that death is here because of sin and death. It's the visitation of God's judgment, just judgment on our sin. So our death is connected to sin and is, is in itself the visitation of God's just wrath against our sin. In other words, we are to draw a line from all misery and death back to sin and learn to hate sin more than we hate its consequences and acknowledge that God is holy and just and we are sinful and deserving of judgment. Verse 7 to 11 speak of a God who is just and righteous. And he has righteously appointed death as the penalty for our sin. So the psalmist contemplates this situation of exile, of the ending of the Davidic line. And he's thinking about all this, he goes to God. The psalmist acknowledges that God is our home. The psalmist acknowledges that God is eternal. And the psalmist acknowledges that God is is just. So what has happened is not that God's promises have failed. It's not that God's promises have failed. No, we broke God's covenant. We broke God's covenant and he is justly punishing us for our sin. So it's not that God's covenant has failed. No, we forsake, we forsook, we forgot God in the covenant. And he justly, righteously appointed death as the penalty for sin. And fourthly, God is gracious. Then Moses turns to God in prayer. And we could number this prayer several, several different ways. You could number it in seven parts. You could number it in more parts than that. I'm going to concentrate on six, I think. I, I put quite a few in, so if I miscounted, forgive me. Six specific petitions in this prayer with you today. If you look at verse 12, the first prayer, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. What does that mean? Teach us to number our days. It means to value and realise the brevity of this life. And here's the thing. We will never learn this lesson. We will never rightly estimate human life or appreciate its brevity unless the Lord brings it home to us. Which is why he prays, teach us to number our days. He's asking us to be more concerned with living well than living 
long. William Swan Plummer, who was a Presbyterian theologian, once said, some die old at 30 and some die young at 90. Which is actually very profound. But teach us to number our days. So that's the first prayer. The second prayer is in verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants. There is the acknowledgement. Lord, we're in this mess because of sin. But now he turns the Lord's words back on him. When Adam sinned in Genesis 3, what did he say? From the dust you came, to dust you shall return. And in the psalm we're reminded of that. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. And then the psalmist says, we deserve it, Lord. But now I'm going to take these words and turn them back to you. Lord, you return. You return to us. Reverse the curse. Show us mercy. That is the second prayer. Return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. It's a plea for God to come to us and reverse the curse. And what is the basis of it? That is the third prayer in verse 14. The third prayer, if you're counting. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. God's covenant love. In other words, the psalmist is making the same plea that David made in Psalm 51. Forgive me, O Lord. Why? Because of your loving kindness. Satisfy us with your loving kindness. Your loving kindness is better than life. Forgive us because of your loving kindness. Then the prayer in verse 15 is the fourth prayer. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Balance out the sorrows of life with God-given joy. We've just sung this last week, we? Joy to the world. Or we may not have done because it was too high, but never mind. But here is the thing. In the New Testament, we know that the Lord answers this prayer better than Moses prays it. Moses asked for the sorrow of life to be balanced with joy. Verse 15, make us glad for as many days as, as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. What Paul says, this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And Peter says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while you've been grieved by various trials. You rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. No wonder James says, consider it joy, brethren, when you endure various kinds of trials. God answers this prayer better than Moses prays it. And fifth petition in verse 16, he says, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. In other words, Lord, we want to see the redemptive work of love and mercy. We want to see the evidence of your working, which is much like Simeon's prayer from last week. Lord, I want to see your salvation. So he can pray, Lord, you can take me home now. I can die because my eyes have seen your salvation. I want to see you at work, Lord. I want to see your redemptive work and have that mercy operative in my life. Every time we see someone come to faith in Christ, every time we see someone grow in Christ, we all want to see the Lord work. We want to see the Lord's love and mercy at work in people's lives. And that is the prayer. Lord, no matter what is happening in our situation, let your work and your majesty appear to us. And then finally this, verse 17, the sixth petition. I think I counted, counted correctly, six. Let the favour, in verse 17, let the favour of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Confirm the work of our hands. Make our work matter and make it last. Make it mean something. Use it. Use us, Lord. Use us. May our time be used in your service, Lord. Do not let us do meaningless things. 
Make our work matter. Prosper the work of our hands. No matter what our situation is, Lord, give us meaningful work, work that matters. The psalmist is facing a great challenge, and the challenge is, Lord, I do not understand what you are doing. It looks like your promises have failed. And Moses points us to God, and he leads us to God in prayer, because God is our home. God is our help. God is our hope. And because of that, we can get through anything. Which is a very good thought at the end of 2020. God is our home. God is eternal. God is our help. And God is our hope. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your words. And I ask it that you would use it by your Spirit to dwell in us richly. I ask that you would take our words and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's a privilege to gather together for worship, and I wish we were all able to sing. Um, but we're going to close.